Please go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you are the chair of the Senior Strategy Subcommittee for Toronto, trying to turn our city into an internal city, correct? And uh, I, I'm hoping today you'll share a little bit of your strategy, uh, because these the people from U of T and the community are really keen on what you have to say. And uh, we think you're a very special person, because not that many people are interested in it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Institute for Life, Course, and Aging for, for inviting me to, uh, to join you today. Um, and uh, as was said, I'm, I'm Josh Matlow. I'm uh, the city councillor for Ward 22 St. Paul's, which is in Midtown Toronto. And um, the, the import for me with regard to fulfilling a strategy for seniors, and really when I talk about seniors, I really do mean age-friendly, an accessible city for all. Began when I was uh, 13 years old, and my parents forced me to volunteer at a senior's home. And you know, admittedly at 13, it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do with my summer, but my parents said, this will be a good experience for you, and you really should um, Learn, learn what volunteerism is all about. So I went to uh, Baycrest, as I'm sure all of you are familiar with, and uh, and I was a, I was called a volunteer. Yes. <laughs> and um, I spent time with seniors and learned lessons that have um, really followed me to today. Um, lessons that I could only learn from those who had more experience and more knowledge than myself at that age and at this age. I also learned that while I thought that I was going to be one, the one who was altruistically giving of myself, that I came away from that experience with so much. Uh, a sense of meaning, a sense of fulfillment, and lessons such as, you know, the only regrets that I heard from many of the people who I worked with were the things that they never experienced. It, the thing, it wasn't the things that, uh, that, that they messed up on. They learned that that wasn't their path. But it was about taking advantage of the moment you have. Don't lose any of the opportunities that are in front of you. And fulfill your dreams. And I knew that as I was approaching the, the election, that I needed to make seniors' priorities an issue now so that we would have time to see them through to fruition. When I was elected to city council, uh, the first motion that I moved, this was back, I was elected uh, in late 2010, and the first motion that I moved afterwards was to create a senior strategy for the City of Toronto. I'm very well aware that there has been a lot of good work done before. Um, many of you, I know, were part of that good work, and I'm going to expand a bit about that as I go through our presentation. But um, I must say that there have been a number of reasons, whether it be challenges between governments, governments that don't have enough money, governments that don't always work together, but a number of reasons why these good ideas have not come through to fruition. And my interest now is to bring all of that work together, put new ideas into the mix, bring feedback from the community together, and then actually get something done, given the fact that between 17 and 20 percent, or sorry, 17 or 20 percent of people who are on the housing list waiting for affordable housing are seniors. Given the fact that almost one in five of us in 20 years are going to be over the age of 65. Given the fact that between 2001 and 2031, the people the age of 75 are going to double. We need to do something now so that we're not dealing with a crisis when we arrive there in 20 years. We need to be proactive, and that's why we need to use the good work that's been done and then build on it today. So first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, two people who are a big part of this strategy. Uh, first of all, Chloe Ariche, she's my uh, constituency assistant, has been very, very deeply involved in this strategy. I want to thank Chloe for that. Also, Phoenicia Lewis, who she and her team of staff at the City of Toronto, I must say, have not just been working on this because we directed them to as council. They've been doing this because it's been a labor of love. I've seen that in everything they've done. The commitment and dedication has been truly inspiring. And I just want to thank you, Phoenicia, for that. And Phoenicia will be here as well to work with me to answer your questions when we get to the Q&A. So, to start with, we go to the next slide. 
So this is the presentation overview. I'm going to go through everything from the council's direction to the feedback that we're uh, that we're asking for, the uh, data that we're reviewing, and then of course, and most importantly, where we go from here. So when I brought um, my motion to create a senior strategy in 2011 to the City Council, I can tell you that although you hear a lot of noise about the divisiveness of Council, um, probably every day in the headlines, <laughs> <laughs> this motion was passed unanimously. Right, middle, center, uh, left, this passed unanimously, and it's a credit to my colleagues. And we gave staff a direction, as you can see, uh, to uh, we put... We can't see very well. Oh. Because the lights Turn the first light Is off. there a light that we can... Turn the first switch off. Do you need to turn it Turn it off and I'll see if I can... can, if I can Just the this. first switch. The yeah, one that's closest need... to the door. That is the one that's closest to the door. That. I'll be fine. I'll that's be fine. better. Is that okay? The other way. No, the, yeah. other way. The, the other way. What, uh, what Phoenicia is worried about is whether or not I'll be able to read my notes. But it's okay. Oh. But it's okay. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Wait on. Oh, oh, thank you for the challenge. <laughs> that means that the, the, those have those uh, that that little judgment notes that you do at the end. It's going to um, get some more points. So, <laughs> so, um, so we asked uh, staff to convene a uh, staff steering uh, committee, and this committee is uh, really representatives of staff from all the relevant agencies. Uh, all the departments in our in our uh, in our uh, system to be able to put forward uh, uh, their their expertise and collect the information that they're provided with, and also convene a working committee of stakeholders. So, in other words, we need everybody involved, whether it be at different levels of government, school board, uh, non for profits, academics, etc. People who have had a proven track record of championing seniors' issues have come together as part of this uh, stakeholders working group. And what we asked them to do is develop an engagement plan. And some of you were at that all-day uh, workshop that we held recently. Uh, we've been going out, this is another example of it, where we've been going out to the community and asking for feedback. We also have a, work, uh, a workbook, it's a consultation workbook, that we've been sending out left, right, and center throughout the city, asking for feedback. It was, the due date, by the way, for feedback was to be um, September 30th. We've extended it to Halloween, to October 31st, because we want to give as much time as possible to get feedback from average citizens. I've always said uh, to our staff and to my colleagues that while we as politicians are the facilitators of this strategy, it has to be seniors themselves, their loved ones, and caretakers, and people in the non-for-profit and services that are the authors of the strategy that we move forward with. So, Senior Strategy Subcommittee. The Senior Strategy Subcommittee is a, is a subcommittee that is uh, the subcommittee of the Community Development and Recreation Committee of which I sit. I'm not going to attempt to tell you the entire governance model of the City of Toronto, but essentially every councillor sits on a committee. This is a focused subcommittee on this specific issue of which I chair, and two of my colleagues from the Community Recreation uh, Development and Recreation Committee sit on it with me, Councillors Wong Tam and Davis. We're there to essentially guide and steer staff as they produce the strategy with the mm -hmm. feedback from the public. So what does age-friendly mean for seniors? It's important for us to create a city that is inclusive, that, that has social equality, that uh, removes us from the constant um, stigma of ageism, that considers everything from the larger social policy issues with respect to matters such as housing that I mentioned before, to how many benches we can get on the street, how can parks be accessible, how high are the curb cuts, how long does it take somebody to cross at a traffic signal. So in other words, the big picture, the little things, and frankly the little things to the average person are often the big things. An age-friendly community, this recognizes that seniors have a wide range of skills and abilities. It understands and meets the age-related needs of seniors, respects the decisions and lifestyle choices of seniors, protects those seniors who are vulnerable, 
recognizes that seniors have a lot to offer to their community and recognizes how important it is to include seniors in all areas of community life. What I hear from many seniors is that they often feel isolated. We had a debate recently over libraries. You may remember there were some members of council who suggested that, uh, well, some didn't even know who Margaret Atwood was. <laughs> I reminded them that she must be a big football player and, uh, and that libraries uh, should be closed. And I gave an example of a small library. If any of you know my ward, you'll know of Mount Pleasant uh, Library. And my, Mount Pleasant Road Library. It's a storefront. It's a storefront. Yeah, it's a tiny little library on Mount Pleasant Road in the heart of Davisville Village. And uh, circulation is admittedly very low. And one could argue uh, reasonably that it should be shut down because there are very few books circulating in and out of the doors. What I reminded my colleagues was that if you only consider the evidence of circulation, then you can make an argument to close it. But if you consider the wider context, that there's about half a dozen seniors' homes along that very stretch of road, that we have so many seniors who are able to escape isolationism and are able to find a community, a community center, really, in that library. Frankly, for many of them, it's the only place that they go every day then you consider whether or not we should keep a library open. And part of the strategy, while we work with all relevant groups and departments and agencies within our city, also is about looking at all of our decisions to an age-friendly lens. So, for example, here's part of our team. 311, Three, do you all know of 311? So if you ever have a question, you see something broken on the street, um, you can dial 311, and it's a 24-7 information line and conduit to various city services, and they'll connect you. So 311, why would 311 be there? Well, they need to know how to handle calls from a variety of different uh, seniors. And there's gonna be different needs and different concerns. They, a lot of seniors tell me, that they simply don't even know who to call or where to go to for the kind of services or know their rights. And that's why the first people that they speak with need to know how to, how to uh, guide them and how to support them directly. And then, of course, this is self-explanatory. Everything from housing, shelter and support, emergency services, long-term care, parks and forestry recreation, planning, how do we plan our city, transportation services, Revenue services. Transportation services, by the way, this is another example. Many of you have heard about the new Eglinton LRT, the underground cross town that's going to be built along Eglinton Avenue. And this is something that I've been very supportive of. One of the concerns that I heard from seniors along Eglinton was, this is fine and dandy that we're going to have essentially subway stops at the major junctions, Avenue, Young, Mount Pleasant, Bayview. This is fantastic. But what if you live in between? So you're removing the bus and you're putting a, essentially a subway, an underground LRT. But what if you live in between? What if you have mobility challenges and it's, a, it's an icy uh, February morning? What are you going to do? And of course this extends to the age-friendly concept. It would also be a challenge if you're an eight-year-old in a wheelchair or anyone else. It would be a challenge if you're a young mom or dad and you've got a big stroller to push. So that's why we need to consider how we plan transportation for the very people who we want to serve with. We have, along with our various departments in the city, we have what we call ABCs, agencies, boards, and commissions. So they run a variety, a gamut of different uh, uh, priorities across our city, and these are a few. Public health, community housing, police, public libraries, and of course, the TTC. And here are some related initiatives. And we, <clears throat> when we refer to this as related initiatives, as I said, we also know that we shouldn't reinvent the wheel where the wheel has been created. There has been so much good work done over the past 10 years and before that we are relying on and referring to as we move forward with our strategy. But as I've seen far too often, and those of you who are in the advocacy world know as well, whether it be youth violence, 
whether it be building transit and whether it be seniors' priorities. Far too many blue ribbon panels have been called and different royal commissions and wonderful reports have been written at the cost of thousands if not millions of dollars. And for various reasons that I'm going to expand upon, they end up in the dusty archives of history. And once in a while they're referred to in a rhetorical speech somewhere when something goes wrong and it's in the newspaper. What I want is to bring all these out of these archives and put them into action, put them into play, and see something actually done. <clears throat> One of the challenges that we found is that through all these recommendations that have been put forward, through all these different reports, 65% of them are under the city purview, 13% of them are provincial, 3% are federal, and then the ABCs, meaning these quasi-independent agencies, boards, and commissions, are about 19%. Yet, for some reason, fit only 51% uh, from the city, 37% ABCs, 33% federal, 23% provincial have been fully implemented. We see another portion of it partially implemented, and then 11, 23, 33, and 62%, a whopping 62% provincially, and this is all respectable not implemented at all. And by reviewing this, so in other words, we're not just looking forward, we're looking at what has gone wrong in the past so that we don't repeat these mistakes. We're also looking at what has been done in the past so that we can finally bring these things forward. But why hasn't this been done? Why has so relatively few of the, uh, the recommendations actually been uh, implemented? And one of the challenges we found is either there has been a lack of discipline between different jurisdictions as to what their priorities are. You might have one party, let's say, in power at the provincial level that might be uh, persuaded by one ideology and another at the city level or federal government by another. You might have some really good ideas from one level of government, <clears throat> like the city, and then they say, but we can only do these things if the province gives us this much money. And the province will say, thank you very much for your submission, we've got other priorities. Or, these days, the province will say, we're absolutely broke and we've got nothing for you. And so will the federal government, the provincial government, when they ask them. So we also, if I may editorialize, in my humble view, we have a governance structure in this country. Again, whether it be seniors issues, transportation, youth violence, other priorities, that often puts governments against each other in a competitive manner rather than at a table, working together, resolving problems. And that's a reformation that I'd like to see, and that's some, another issue that I'm working on as well. <laughs> That'll be more incremental, I imagine. But, but, it, but it is a challenge. So one of the things that we've done as a city through this strategy is we've already determined that the vast preponderance of work that we're going to do through the senior strategy is not going to rely on another government to give us the allowance to do so, or the money to do so. We don't need to ask Dalton McGinty to put more benches out on the streets of Toronto. We can do that alone. We don't need to ask Dalton McGinty for a number of these good ideas that have already been thought of. We just have to get going on it. And then, of course, those issues that do need to be brought up with other levels of government, we will. And this is why. Currently, seniors are 14% of Toronto's population. And again, that's going to grow to between 17 and 20 percent over the next 30 years, or 20 years. And this is where they're concentrated. We found that the majority of seniors, you, by the way, you see it from dark to light as far as where the concentration of those who are the, over the age of 65 reside. And you see that many of them live in the outer, or the inner suburban areas of the city of Toronto, with a few exceptions right in the heart. And as you can see, we've, yeah, we've got some bundles right here in the heart, but a lot of it is in the inner suburbs. And by the way, speaking of, you know, going back to why everything should be done through the age-friendly lens, 
Do you remember that debate that we just had, that ostensib ostensibly between streetcars and subways? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, first of all, nobody was suggesting streetcars. They're LRTs. They're trains. But one of the reasons that many of us wanted to make sure that rather than just having one subway extension on Shepherd Avenue, but to have multiple new rapid transit lines that would connect Shepherd, connect Finch West, connect the inner suburbs to the city, is because we have seniors and others, and many who, who live in poverty, who live in these neighborhoods, who need access to public transit to be able to improve their quality of life. So I, I, I suggest to you that when you listen to these debates, which often are very black and white and very narrow and very ill-informed through the media, that you consider the wider context. I certainly do when I'm making my decisions. And we can see here that seniors are a large portion of people who live just above or below the poverty line. Many of them are still um, uh, dependent on private pensions or employment. The average uh, salary of a senior is between thirty-five and forty thousand dollars. So, as I mentioned before, we have a consultation workbook, and we have a copy here. And have we brought copies for everyone? So you can either download it online, or I'm going to give you each my card, and if each of you would like a copy, I will make sure you get one. Yeah. So we from the Toronto Council of Aging have a big concern for this, because we, as seniors, were uncomfortable with how to fill it out. And we felt that perhaps it had been designed by <coughs> younger people who didn't realize what our needs were. I appreciate that. What I can assure you of is that this is one way that we're collecting feedback. Yeah. Where we put this out and we've sent it out, you know, to libraries, community centers, we, we elsewhere. That, but but we also recognize the response, the way that it was worded, mm -hmm. created problems with the response. Okay, no, thank you. That's that's important feedback. Yeah. And like like I said, like we've learned from mm -hmm. past work. That's why that's I really good feedback. Yeah. Uh, I've also made a point of personally going out to the community, having these kind of conversations too. Mm -hmm. And I find that, and you're right, I mean, some seniors, especially when they're asked to download things online, mm -hmm. yeah. they don't know where to start. Yeah. So that's a challenge. This is one tool, it's not the only tool that we're using. Yeah. But, I, but that's really good feedback. If you are interested though, and if you, if you do find this helpful, please do fill it out. Because it does run through a number of different areas of interest that we hear. There's also an area, to, the other line, where you can just put in whatever you want to say. And of course, through this discussion too, I want to hear more from you about what your priorities are. But again, we've extended to uh, October 31st. So. Thus far, this is the kind of feedback we're receiving through the admittedly imperfect process. <laughs> So, you know, you always hear about healthcare as the number one issue in the polls. What's well, interesting when you get past the polls and you really just go and talk with people, housing is the number one issue that we hear about from seniors. Um, you know, I, I'm, as, as, as you may understand, uh, I work on a number of issues at the same time in my life as a counselor. And one of the issues that I've been working on are to, to, to improve our, our housing situation in the city. I'm working closely with my colleague, Councillor Anna Bailau, who's been a real champion of this issue. And one of the things I've been doing is I've been, having a, I've been going on a tour of all the Toronto community housing buildings in my ward and doing town halls like this and really just hearing from them, getting their honest feedback, having candid conversations. And at virtually all of them, whether they be specifically seniors' buildings or not, the majority of them I find are seniors. We have a backlog of 70,000 people on the waiting list to get into social housing in the city. For those people, that means anywhere from seven to nine years waiting list. 
If you're 70 to 80 years old, you may not get there. That's why it's a crisis, and I don't think it's intemperate to call it such. And that's why we're hearing from people that it's their priorities. Health, of course, this is something that we can do at the city level, but it is something that we need to work with the province on. Transportation, the same. Recreation. Um, parks are often, for many seniors who live in apartment buildings, condos as well, parks are their backyards. And we need to make sure that parks are accessible, but they're also user-friendly. Safety and security is a, 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 of, of huge import to seniors. And this is something that I think every level of government needs to take interest in. Whether it be seniors abuse, whether it be people taking advantage of seniors, that's something we all need to work on together. And then of course accessibility. Civic engagement too. You know, when I talk about isolation, it's not only isolation from the daily world, although that is a serious issue for many seniors but also knowing that they still have a voice in the democratic process, in the public forum. And I think that often is, the challenge with that is often subject to ageism in our society. Some people start treating seniors like we do children. And we, we give some seniors the sense that they're no longer part of the age of majority, that they're no longer part of the power structure of our society. And I think it's vital that as government, we engage and we re-engage and we remind seniors that they're the ones that built what we have and their voice is just as important. And sometimes more because of the knowledge and experience that they're able to share than others. Oh, and I'm sorry, I just want to touch on diversity. When we ask people to make their voice heard, the vast majority, whether they be seniors or youth or anyone else, are often people who have already been told and have already gained that, that, uh, that sense of entitlement through various means in their life, that they're allowed to raise their voice. But there are many people in our society who still need us to reach out to them. We have uh, seniors who come from every background, whether it be ethnic, religious, uh, economic uh, means, sexual orientation, and they also need to be engaged in this conversation. I, uh, last Pride, uh, Toronto Pride, I went to this, uh, this barbecue, the pancake breakfast, uh, rainbow pancake breakfast, Smarties, I ate too much. Um, and I heard these amazing stories from seniors who were LGBTQ during Decades that it was literally illegal to be so. Mm -hmm. And boy, do they have a lot to share. And I think that they need to be at the forefront of this conversation. Other themes. So communication. Like I said, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people just, they may have heard that they have rights or services, but if they don't know who to ask or where to go, they become somewhat moot. So we need to connect the dots. Communication uh, in other languages. Toronto uh, is arguably the most diverse city in the entire world. And the services that we provide and the way that we provide them need to reflect that fact. Dedicated point person to deal with seniors' affairs. We have, champion, we have a champion for children. We have various accountability officers. We need to consider having a point person that seniors know that they can go to to not only ensure that the services are there, but to protect their rights. Funding. We already know that many, many of our seniors are low-income uh, seniors, low-income people. So how should that reflect our decisions when we consider a budget, when we consider taxation, when we consider rebates on, uh, on whether it be land transfer tax or what have you? We need to consider the very people who we are being asked to support our society when we need to think about how to support them. And diversity and respect, well, I, I noted on that. But I think as a civil and just society, it should go without saying. Unfortunately, it needs to continue to be said uh, because far too often we, we don't pay enough attention to that while we create the legislation and policy. So most importantly, 
Now that we're going through what's been done in the past, looking at the data, and informing ourselves about where we stand today, where do we go from here? So we need to focus on deliverables. And when I say deliverables, in my first conversation with staff when we first started developing the strategy, I said, we had David Miller as a mayor two years ago. We have Rob Ford for a mayor today. We had Mike Harris as a premier. Now we have Dalton McGinty. Um, things change in government. Different ideologies come and go. Different governments have more or less money, and the economy is better or worse at different times. None of that can stand in our way. We need something more Teflon. We need a strategy that has deliverables and no more excuses. Like I said, everything we do needs a seniors or more an age-friendly lens. Every time we design a park, when we design structures, when we, when we design our city, the city needs to reflect the people who live here and who are going to live here. We need to build on city programs and services that already exist. If the wheel is there, don't reinvent it. It's more time, more money, and then we're losing time and resources to work on the new things. Find ways for the city to collaborate with other partners. The days of blaming the province from the city, or the province blaming the city, or the city blaming the school board, or the city and the province blaming the federal government must come to an end. Because I don't think the average resident really cares at the end of the day whose fault it was. <laughs> All they care about is that they elected us as elected representatives to be problem solvers, to sit down, lock ourselves in a room, and not leave until we figure it out. And that's what I'm saying to my counterparts at every level of government, that we are colleagues, and we need to work respectfully together to arrive at solutions today. Minimize, I'm sorry, I, didn't, I, I gave the signal. <laughs> Minimize isolation and improve well-being. This must be based on reliable research and proven best practices. We must be able to justify everything we say. Far too often I find at City Council that there's a lot of rhetoric, a lot of sound bites thrown out on a lot of different issues. This is something, when we, when we move forward with this strategy, I want it to be unanimously. I want this to be based on evidence. This isn't right-wing. This isn't left wing. This isn't Rob Ford. This isn't David Miller. This is for our seniors. And frankly, our seniors voted for both of them at different times, right? Um, and clearly articulate who is responsible through an account accountability framework. Rather than blaming each other, as I said before, somebody needs to own each purview. When I talk about the problems with our governance model, I also see too much overlap. We have a board of health at the city, we have a ministry of health at the, the province, the federal government dips into health when it comes to allocation of money, um, education, there's a number of different areas where we have formal under legislation purviews, but then there's a lot, of, a lot of ability for everyone to point fingers. And then, it, it, especially when we're discussing something as, as wide a scope as serving seniors and creating age-friendly cities. There are so many different levels of government and agencies and boards and commissions that need to work together that if nobody is responsible for anything, then it's always easy to, again, rely on the default option of blaming everybody else when things don't get done. So that's why we need a champion for seniors in the city of Toronto to, hold, to be an accountability officer, to hold us, government, to account. And everybody who's delegated to do something, we are, we're going to have to keep note of that and they're going to need to have to report to us on what they've done. And if they haven't done it, we as the people need to say, why not? And if you don't do it, we're going to hold you to account. So speaking of that, next steps. So along with that miserable work group, workbook that we heard about, that actually has informed us quite, quite, quite substantially. And I say that in jest because it has been helpful. But to all the feedback that we've received, all the public meetings, all the discussions we've had, working with the Toronto Seniors Forum, who have been champions at City Hall for, for many, many years, working with non-for-profits, they're already doing such good work on the ground, and we need their expertise and support. 
We're bringing all of that information together, and then there's going to be a meeting with the seniors expert panel, and all that information through the expert panel will end up going to our subcommittee. At our subcommittee, there is an ability for each resident, whomever would like to, to make a five-minute deputation. So um, if you are interested in coming to us and giving us a five-minute deputation, again, I'm going to give you my card, contact my office, we'll make sure that you know how to do that. And then the counselors get to grill you and ask you questions too. Um, then it goes to Community Development and Recreation Committee, which again is the committee that we are a subcommittee of, of which I'm a member. There's also an ability to make deputations when this item comes to that committee. I, I think the more the merrier at that one, because it'll be a high profile discussion. And again, along with you know, the, the substantive detail work we, we're doing, we also need to raise the profile of seniors' priorities. If the mayor, if council, if the world doesn't understand that this is a vital and urgent issue, then there won't be that sense of urgency from them to get this done. I want them to understand how critical it is. So then we will make a decision about the recommendations, whether or not we support <coughs> the strategy, whether or not we have amendments to the strategy, but we will deliver a recommendation to city council in spring of 2013. And at that meeting, it'll be all 45 members of council. You're not allowed to make a deputation there. That's the final decision there. But the mayor and 44 councillors, including myself, will have an opportunity to uh, debate and discuss uh, the recommendations, possibly make amendments if we see that there's nuances that we want to contribute, if we've heard from our constituents that there are contributions that, that, are, that, that we still need to be made, that made. And then we move on. Where we go from there is up to all of us. What I ask you all to do as members of the public, as not-for-profit champions, as people who are involved in advocacy for seniors, is to keep a close eye on us, and I include myself in us, all of us who are working on this. Because, like I said at the beginning, far too often we've seen great reports written, and committees formed, and big announcements, and big press releases, and for some reason, and I think for many of the reasons that I have shared with you today, it just doesn't happen or not enough of it happens. So you need to keep our feet to the fire. And you need to keep reminding us that we made a promise, we made a commitment. And frankly, I know that this, just like when I volunteered at Baycrest, this isn't altruistic for me. I'm going to be a senior, God willing, in a few years from now. <laughs> I'm expecting my first child January 1st and I want to create a age-friendly city for her. It's her. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to remind my colleagues that what we're doing working on this strategy, developing it with our amazing staff, and then most importantly seeing it through to fruition in a real way is something that we will all be proud of. It's a legacy that is so important. But we have an urgency, and we need to do it now. Thank you. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. By the way, may I just share a quote? May I share a quote? I thought this was wonderful. Have you all heard of Moses Snyder? Yeah. So Moses Snyder, he's leading uh, CARP, Canadian Association of Retired Persons. He also was the creator of City TV. You may have seen that uh, on, on, on television. And uh, Moses, uh, uh, I was just with him. We just had a flag raising uh, for Carpent City Hall the other day. And he said, 20 years have been added to lives in the past 60 years. It's a miracle, really, and we want to emphasize the positives of that. And it's not just a cause for alarm, but a cause for celebration. In other words, and by the way, my mom calls herself the Silver Fox. <laughs> She's the most vibrant, like incredible woman I know. And we don't need to look at this as a challenge. You keep hearing, oh, what are we going to do about social insurance? Or, you know, there's going to be no money left. 
Uh, what are we going to do about the healthcare system because seniors are becoming, we're having more and more seniors. It's, it's, it's awful. What are we going to do? I think we also need to celebrate the fact that we are living longer, that seniors are a, um, a, a meaningful and you know, vivacious part of our society. And that being a senior doesn't mean that you are dependent on our society. Being a senior means that you have wisdom, and knowledge, and experience, and a joie de vivre that is unending. And I think that we need to celebrate that as we face the challenges together. So therefore, thank you. I'm open to any questions you have. Thank you. Yes. I, I wanted to say that uh, Kathleen Wynn, the, the, one of the uh, ministers of, she's the Minister of Housing and Native Affairs right now, um, but she said to two of us who were visiting her the other day, <clears throat> she said, I'm very anxious that a ministry for seniors becomes established. And she said, lobby like mad. Tell everybody to do it. So that's a very interesting situation because certainly the seniors affairs as you know in the province it gets tucked in behind another little piece here or and it keeps changing from one ministry to another and a ministry for seniors would be a very effective way um, that might lead to uh, policy for seniors the feds don't have any policy for seniors uh, as such um, and so if we could get the Ministry of, um, for uh, Seniors in the province, it would be a great event. So everybody, talk about it. I, uh, not, not only do I agree with you, but just like the city needs someone to hold us accountable yeah. at the city level, we have a Minister of Children and Youth Services yes. at the provincial yeah. level. Um, the interesting thing about politicians I've found, and those of you who have been politicians in the past know, that Politicians, if they have a certain <clears throat> title, then they're held more accountable. Uh, if they are the chair of a certain committee, mm -hmm. uh, they then want to be able to boast that they <coughs> did something. Mm -hmm. If they have a media microphone in their face saying, what did you do? They want to have a list of things that they achieved. <laughs> so it's incredibly helpful to have roles, to have, it's part of the accountability structure. Somebody needs to be said, we're delegating this to you. Just like when you meet with, with a group about anything, you need to be able to say, you are responsible for this, that's your role, and at our next meeting, you need to tell us what you've delivered on. And the thing about politicians is they want to keep their jobs. So You need to run for mayor. Uh, that's very kind. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Josh, a terrific presentation and uh, great outline of all the things that should be done and not just table and whatever have you. I was wondering when you had all these answers from the questionnaire, let's say transportation for example, what kind of hope might there be that there is some collaboration, not with government necessarily, but government <coughs> leading uh, to say uh, we have these particular issues and private collaboration and public collaboration at the same time with some of these things. Or, or take an, an issue, you mentioned the benches on, on the street, is a collaboration between store owners and, and the city. So I mean, where will the pathways, where will the pathways, traffic lights that will last yeah, yeah. longer so people can actually get across the street? Whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. So where, you know, I'm sure you have this in, in mind, but I think I just wanted to push you to go beyond just listing them to say where, you know, give some example of any of Let me give you one example, and I'll, and I'll ask Venetia if you yeah. have any uh, yeah. and Venetia, please feel welcome to sure. contribute your, because yeah. Venetia's really working yeah. a lot of the substance of the report yeah. too. Um, BIAs are a good example. BIAs are business improvement areas, and many uh, retail strips in our city have um, BIAs. It's uh, in the group of businesses that have come together. They levy uh, a charge from each of the businesses that contribute to a, a, a pot that will then contribute to various uh, good things for uh, the commercial district and therefore the community. Uh, so they can raise money for um, street skating improvements, uh, beautification projects, new trees, flower pots, etc. That can also go towards benches. That can also go towards, um, you know, I've been speaking to some businesses in my area about um, there's a stop gap uh, program where there's this young man, I think he's in his 20s, who had a spinal cord injury a few years ago uh, while bicycling. And he dedicated his time now 
to uh, create this small ramp that can be inserted right where, like right into where you've just got that one little step into some of the shops. Mm -hmm. And for some seniors, and again, a young man like him or moms and dads with strollers, that can be really the question of whether or not you you have access to that shop. Mm -hmm. So these are the kind of things that we can definitely work with private business <coughs> and, and publicize. And publicize. <laughs> and you know, when the mayor talks about working with the private sector, yeah. you know, it's like he says private sector and the left one goes, no, 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 everything should be public. My view is like, yeah, private sector, but then you need to articulate what that means. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't usurp the import of the public like domain. So there's a nugget of truth in what the mayor says, but it just isn't fully thought through or articulated. Yeah, just to add to that, in terms of us working together, the 16 different divisions and ABCs, what's really important, and we talked about that last week, Friday, is that as policy staff, we cannot come forward with the same thinking that created those prior recommendations. We need to really step back, and maybe quite a few steps back, and look at what can we be done what can be done within the realm of our services that we're providing, but being very open. And I don't want to sound cliche thinking outside the box. It can be outside the triangle, outside the box, outside the circle, whatever it is. But we need to really be more open. And one way of being more open is allowing partnerships, working with our Toronto Office of Partnerships and seeing what can we leverage here? What opportunities can be created? Yes, working with the BIAs, and it was actually mandated through council that we work with the private sector. It's not only about the ABCs or the different divisions that we work with, but it's more, more importantly, this is a huge opportunity that we need to capitalize on, not to use that word, but to capitalize on, because we're, we're being faced with a reality in terms of budget. What kind of recommendations will we bring <coughs> forward that's going to be costing us more money? We don't have the money. So now we're forced to think differently. And, and that's exactly where our 20 different partners that we're working with is on that path. One, 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 one last aspect of that. You, we all know that as, as vital as the public realm is, a lot of the city is in private hands, as, as, it, as, as understandably so. So you know, when we talk to developers, for example, they need to be part of the conversation about what kind of structures they're designing and how accessible they're going to be. So everybody needs to be part of the conversation, too. But the leadership can come, therefore, from starting from the public sector. That's, Absolutely. That's what you've articulated very well. And that's why, yes. and, and this will be the conduit. Yeah, thank you. Sure, you and then we'll go right back to you. Maybe when um, condos are allowed to be put up by developers, a portion of them should be allocated for low rental housing. We have a glut of <coughs> condos right now in the market. We keep hearing we're two years overbuilt. Why can't we use some of these? Build them up with people, but have expectations that they man maintain them. Fair, fair, fair point, fair point. I think, I mean, I always struggle with sort of how far we should go to prescribe what the private sector should do, and then recognizing that we do have a free society and a free market society, where do we cross the line that not one of us would want government to infringe upon in our own lives? And I think that, you know, with developers, there's a lot that we should dictate. Oh, precisely. Maybe not every building everywhere, but should they be contributing to affordable housing? Yes. And maybe not in every one of the buildings, but maybe there should be maybe there should be a certain charge that goes towards it. And one of the conversations that we're having as a city right now is ideas such as that. In other words, how do we engage the development industry far enough that they contribute their fair share, but not too far that they don't continue mm -hmm. contributing to our economy? But it's, it's a fine line. <coughs> yeah. Uh, hi, Jeff. Hi. <laughs> um, it's safe to hear your presentation. I actually just returned to Toronto from New York City, where I've been working on the age friendly New York City project, which if you've been following that, you know, there's some really amazing things happening and some small wins and big wins. And your comment about business is right on. I mean, one of the, one of the ways forward in New York was to partner with the businesses. Yeah. And now we have age-friendly businesses in New York City. And of course, businesses want to be on that list. And so we have <laughs> criteria for them, established criteria about what they need to do to be an age-friendly business. 
and things are really changing. App, there's a new Apple store in New York City that wanted to be really age friendly, and now they have workshops for seniors, <coughs> in, like early in the morning when you know the young hipsters don't want to be going to Apple Store at 8 a.m. And uh, <laughs> so uh, and they've opened up the store and they're doing special workshops for them. And there's just like hundreds of amazing programs using school buses to take seniors who are in food deserts where they don't have grocery stores near them and school buses have been sitting empty on streets mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. using those to go into communities and take seniors, doesn't cost them any money, to grocery stores and things like that. So it's really exciting things. But one of the one of the reasons I think that New York has been very successful is that um, different from some of the other age-friendly initiatives globally, and I've also been sort of part of the World Health Organization and and, and followed the work that they've been doing there is because New York City did weren't they didn't follow along with the first group of work of the World Health Organization they came in later and what they did differently from the very beginning is they had City Council involved mm -hmm. and like all of City Council and Mayor Bloomberg it's on his radar screen and they did a huge assessment of every city policy and every department had to look at every one of their policies and programs through an age-friendly lens. And it's like amazing. And so I'm, my question, I guess, is just um, how, how much buy-in is there from city council generally, and where are we at in that process? Because I think there's lots of little wins that can happen, but until we really move this forward, we need to have yeah. Yeah, um, uh, fair, fair question. I, uh, first of all, um, about a month ago I was in uh, Manhattan and I met with Gail, uh, Councilwoman Gail Brewer, yeah, yeah. Oh, I know uh, who's Gail. been a big yeah. part of the, the uh, uh, age-friendly uh, strategy. Age-friendly age district. Yes. Age-friendly improvement. So, and, and as you know, she her district is the is the Upper West Side and yeah. the West Side uh, and goes down to Hell's Kitchen. And so what, what she's got, as you probably know, she's got even these amazing flyers that have every grocer yeah. in, on, on the west side of Manhattan, and she delivers it to all the buildings uh, in her inner ward or in her district, and um, it will tell seniors where they can go, where there'll be somebody there to help them, somebody to bring things to their transit or car. Uh, you know, there's a whole, as you said, a criteria for meeting that, and of course, these grocers want to be on the list because they're yeah. getting advertisement from a council member. Yeah. So it's a, it's a it's a it's a wonderful partnership. Um, so anyway, yeah, and Gail is fantastic. As far as uh, our, our council here in Toronto, there's different, like to be very candid with you, like any issue, there's different levels of involvement and, and interest. Um, I think, like, I find that a lot of politicians, along with the accountability issues that I discuss, also like dealing with things that are more high profile and media friendly, because they get their name in the news. So, you know, we're dealing with, you know, transit is, is, is the big one right now in the city. Um, housing is another one that's captured a lot of interest. Seniors' issues, it's not really on the radar screen as one of the top issues. You rarely see it in, in the media. It's just not something that, that most council members are like flying towards because they just don't, you know, it's just, they're not getting tons of emails every day saying, what are you doing about it? They're I want that to change. Mm -hmm. Pardon me? And they're not getting older. And they're not getting older. Definitely not. <laughs> Age-friendly cities are just friendly cities. Absolutely. And that's, the, and that's the tagline. So, but, 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 but uh, to complete the answer, though, I think it's only because it's not the urgent issue in the media in front of them what what's coming in by email. It's not because in their heart they don't believe in it or intellectually understand it, at least to a certain level of of information, of being informed. So what I found is that when I brought my motion, my, uh, my initial motion to council, there was not only, there, I didn't find that there was that mean-spirited divisiveness that you see and experience through all the other issues that, you know, you, you hear about in the news all the time, but there's actually a lot of kindness for what I was doing, uh, and that came from every, every counselor. Um, I think that there was a general sense of, this is good, uh, it's not really on our radar, but we're glad you're doing it. What I'm hoping is, and by the way, my colleagues uh, on Community Development and Recreation Committee, especially Councillors Kristen Longtam and Janet Davis, who sit with me on the subcommittee, are keenly interested and keenly involved. 
I also, once in a while, just will have a counselor come up to me, like Counselor Raymond Cho, who's always like, what's going on? What's going on? I really care about seniors. What's going on? Wow. Oh, yeah. And, and then even like a counselor like Giorgio Mamalidi, <laughs> who, who, is a, who, is a, who is a colorful source. <laughs> He and I may not always agree on exactly the path or, or the direction. I believe in his heart of hearts. He wants something good to come out of this. And my job is to unite people in that cause at council. I believe that when we come back with, with our strategy, as long as we don't tell people that we're going to raise a lot of taxes, I think we should be OK. <clears throat> But I also hope to generate correspondence from the public. And that's where I need your help. And I, and I say this from, for, you know, to every stakeholder, anyone who cares about this. When this comes to council, please write to your counselor. Tell your friends to write to their counselor. Get your family to write to their counselor. Politicians respond to things that that they need to respond to. Um, because there's always a thousand things happening at the same time. Um, I, you know, yesterday I had 20 different, you know, how many items on the agenda? Probably 100 different items on a meeting agenda that I was at. What will I react to immediately if I'm getting a bunch of calls about something at that moment about something important and urgent? So they need to hear from me. Um, I believe that, to answer your question in a nutshell though, I think that we're going to get council support. We just need to word it in a way that isn't divisive, that doesn't talk about either privatizing things or raising lots of taxes. It's got to be just, here's what we've got to get done, and let's deliver. You can tell them they're all getting older. Mm -hmm. I will, and, I'll, and, and we all need to remind them of that. Yeah. Send them out to volunteer. Well, you know, in, to, in fairness to them, being a counselor, I mean, many of them have been there a lot longer than I have, and, I, and I'm learning about, you know, how many, you know, how many nights you're you're out. You know, you don't get paid extra, right? To have be at community meetings. Uh, tonight, I'm meeting with another one of my community housing buildings. Um, whether it be, you know, Rob Ford or Gord Perks or anyone in between, they all do a lot. I think they do a lot of work that could be considered volunteers in a certain way. Um, well, excellent job. I just want to thank you very much for putting all of the elements out there. One of the interesting things that came up in your questionnaire was the issue of funding. And, and I know that you've mentioned tax credits and a lot of different stuff, but really going back to the whole issue of low-income seniors. When we're talking about tax credits where income isn't really um, coming in, or we're talking about people that are you know, caring for both aging parents and may not have access, I'm speaking from a caregiver perspective, um, people who may not have access to work, when you're talking about tax credits, that's great. But what about direct sources of funding to people to help them get equitable access to some of these community programs that we talked about? Uh, ways for people to stay in their homes, in their communities. One of the major things happening in Ontario right now is that we have 77,000 um, long-term care beds. But as we age, we're going to need 238,000 care beds. That's not going to be possible simply because of funding limitations. So the way that we're going to get there is to use the housing innovatively to think <coughs> outside of the box, as you said. Group housing is a really great strategy. There's so many different alternatives that we can be tacking, uh, t tapping into. And, and as you said, there's so much in the archives, all these great recommendations that we can go back to and really start to charge forth and put forth these ideas innovatively, but within the funding structures that we all have right now, recognizing that we're all, com there's collaborative but competing interests all at the same time. We're all competing for the same pot of money. But we can do that collaboratively. Uh, at the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, for example, we work directly with personal support workers and provide them dementia-related education about how to provide better care to seniors on dementia issues. Dementia is a huge issue. It's, it's not one of these sexy topics. You know, it's not transportation. It's not, but it is going to be a major problem. And you know what? One of the best taglines that I can think of is aging is everybody's business. It's not just housing. It's not just transportation, but it's everybody's business because I'm a daughter. I have a mother. I have other family members. I may have my own children one day who will have to, you know, think about me as I age. So it's not just transportation or housing is everybody's business. And, and frankly, transportation and housing is seniors' business, too. That's so exactly right. So if we can get that 
and, and sort of buy in that it's everybody's business at every stage. It's not just housing or not just transportation, but everybody's business all the time, as you were saying. An age-friendly society is just a friendly city yep. in, in general. I think that that would be the key leverage that we can use to really get more buy-in. That's an important message. And you're right, funding is, no matter what we discuss these days, is, is often that wall that you hit. I mean, we, we, we fund about, I think, eight long-term care facilities out of the city of Toronto. We're only funded by the province for one. So it's always a challenge to figure out how, to, how do you pay for it. And frankly, we could use more. I worked for After Homes for the Age as a nurse consultant from 75 to 80. First of all, in the preventive, pro preventive care program, which was based out. So let me tell you about it. People lived in private homes, group homes, and satellite centers. It was a prevention of putting them into institutions. When they went into hospital and they couldn't go back into their homes, then they did go into one of the long-term care, or one of the homes for the aged. They phased that out. It was a shame. I had west of Young Street. I had some wonderful private homes where only one or two or three people lived, but they had a quality of life that was phenomenal. It was fantastic. Group homes, Spencer House was the largest group home. It still exists today. It wasn't the greatest. But we had group homes. We had one down on Lakeshore Lakeview Lodge that housed 13 people. These people lived together in a community setting like you're talking about, and they loved it. And let me tell you, last Thursday I was at a networking breakfast and heard David Chilton speak, the wealthy barber. He said, folks, life is changing. We're going to go for smaller homes. We're going to go for community living homes. Because that's the way people are going to get together, because that's what they can afford. And it's a shame that Toronto lost out on this preventive care program. It was fabulous. And that's why when, you know, that's why we include planning and in how we how we, we need to develop the strategy. We had about 250 people on the program. Mm -hmm. That's like a home for the age. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, one of the things I'm concerned about is the isolation of seniors because we're, we get warehoused into seniors' homes. Yeah. Now, it's the choice of some people. They really want to live with all seniors. But I also saw my mother age much more quickly once she moved into a senior's home, because she moved in at the younger age of the seniors in the building, but all her models were older people. Um, in England now, there's a move towards integrating um, seniors' housing into the community. For instance, one experiment has been to build seniors' housing over community centres or over libraries, so that people have immediate access in their own building with those resources and mingled with young people as much as they want to be. Um, so they're not isolated from the community. I think we have a lot of work to do um, with how to, do, how to um, design different creative approaches to this. And the fear people have in, in my age group is that if you don't move into a senior's residence, you're not going to get into long-term care. Um, we would like to live alone, but I've just recently seen four of my friends develop quite serious problems. Mar these are married friends who have ended up being separated because the spouse who became ill had to be moved into some kind of support system, but the spouse was not able to accompany them, so they after years of marriage, are uh, separated out in that system. Uh, another couple moved into um, a senior's residence in order that they could stay together so that he could qualify for um, long-term care within that residence situation. But that was expensive, was because they had adequate funding, they could do that. I think, I mean, I'm very reluctant to move into a senior's residence, but it's an encouragement for my family to do so. Don't. Because I love having children on my floor in my building. <laughs> I'm part of a community. I know 200 people in the building I Stay live in. I can bring people in the elevator. I don't want to do that change. I don't need to at this point. I hear about people moving before they need to because of the fear that they won't get the access. Home care is not meeting the need, not allowing people to and we, and we, and we, We've support. spoken a lot about how interaction is a very right. important part right. of, of this strategy and how, and how you know, I mean, I, I spoke about isolation before, but I do recognize 
that while you know when we plan our city, how we plan our city, and those are great ideas about you know about libraries and community centers. Yeah. We already Alberta is doing what you're talking about. Alberta mm -hmm. is doing. They're called. They're they're like life leases for seniors, but when a couple have one spouse has a need and the other one doesn't, they can have a studio, a one bedroom or a two bedroom. And there's care for the spouse that needs the care, but the other person has the flexibility and freedom to get out into the community to do other things. I just learned about it yesterday. Can I, one well, other comment from New Zealand is that they are suffering the same demographic change that we are, fewer children, so they have several schools. They're renovating the schools into resources for seniors as well as public services. So that rather than seeing it as a, it, it, we have a difficulty if departments don't work together but, very well. But that, that, that's, an, that's another, in, so uh, when I mentioned how I, I'm, I want to see if I can, and again, I know this sounds like so like wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, like I want to see if I can reform the governance system <laughs> in this country. <laughs> Can I just a little, a little, a little task, a little task, I, you know, some, some, somebody my age when I'm a senior might go, remember that guy, uh, John Gallo, yeah, I'm still working on that, but, but, but I see it as, I was on the school board, and I saw that firsthand how, when we were debating the school pool issue, this was a perfect example of how the school board announced they were going to close all the school pools, every one of them, and, and the school board said, well, they really should be parks and recreation, they should be the cities. So go blame the city for not funding them. Yes. And then parents, and, and by the way, not just parents, students and seniors and others who would use these pools after school hours, then would go to the city and say, okay, well, it's your responsibility to have recreation opportunities for us. And the city said, well, actually, the province funds education, so go talk to the minister in, the, in Queen's Park about that. And then they went to the minister, and the minister said, well, actually, this, these are really local decisions that we want to respect. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to, you know, do anything that will uh, uh, disrespect uh, the local uh, decision makers, and therefore everyone was doing this. And so, one of the things I've done is I've brought a motion that's going to be considered, um, uh, I think, in November, to create a city school board working group so that we can consider how we can work together and consider how we use facilities as part of that too, uh, whether it be fields, whether it be pools. And also the school board now, because of declining enrollment, dramatic declining enrollment, are considering selling a number of their properties. And I think that we need to, while we're going through this transformation, we need to consider how we can turn a lot of these public entities into community hubs. And that, you know, if you're a lefty, you'll like that because it's a great social policy effort. And if you're a righty, just call it efficiency, right? But it's good, I think it's, I th I think it's good governance. Yes. Oh, uh, one. Don't please use Moses' name. Right. <laughs> My name. He is not well liked by seniors. No. 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 He is. No. But that's not. Excuse me. That's not the point. A phrase in there said, "It's not just a cause for alarm." Why are you using that? We're not a cause for alarm. The proof is there. The costs are not high. There are a lot of myths, and Moses Namer is feeding into it, right. and you are feeding into it by using that quotation, which I don't think you've reflected on. So I suggest either edit, and don't put it as a quotation, Use the last phrase, if you like, but take that one out. Mm -hmm. Secondly, developers, when they want to develop a building above the zoning, they have to give something back. There was a tradition at City Council to demand daycare, social housing contributions. Yes. Mm -hmm. There is a solution. You can do it if Council wants it. Right? right. Thirdly, why cut your income? Why cut the payment for the driving license? Why put a cap on property taxes when we are in fact in the GTA paying lower property taxes 
than the surrounding municipalities. So city council has in fact cut its capacity to respond, and I'm not blaming you, because I know you didn't vote that way, but you know, it's stupid to claim you haven't got the money if something's going to cost you do, but you have a mentality on council that says no tax increases. Yeah. Stupidity beyond belief. Okay, well, you were slightly reserved in your, in your comments. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer them. Uh, I don't what was his name? So, okay, so, so, so number one, I'll be the first to admit that when we were coming up with a quote, the first quote I thought of was one from Lionel Richie because he's Tanisha's favorite singer. Um, then we thought, well, Moses is uh, is an advocate uh, for seniors. No, he has no, 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 and hold on, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. This yeah, with, 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 with respect. And and therefore we chose a quote from him. That being said though, I had no idea how political this would be. <laughs> Stop wow. throwing in cars. Wow. Not to lie over to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, 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 so perhaps Phoenicia will get her way. But, 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 uh, but I, 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 I don't want to, listen. The whole emphasis is shifted. Folks. Uh, so I, I, I didn't I didn't realize that you know, I, usually when I go into a room people want to talk about uh, Rob Ford and all those issues I had no idea Moses Snyder would be the lightning rod of contention. But I also raising him. It's that response. So no, no, I want to address that. So to those who have uh, take up uh, issues with Moses, please have that uh, direct conversation with him. I'm not getting in the middle of that. I'm not getting in the middle of that. As far as the quote, as far as the quote itself. I think I, you know. I think the, the the sentiment that I saw, but I I absolutely validate your interpretation completely, was simply that far too often with this and other issues too, we say, oh my gosh, ring the alarm bells, you know, and I think we need to be reminded that you know having seniors in our society is not only what we see as a challenge or a burden. It's actually something we need to celebrate. The fact that we're living longer is actually, I think, a really good thing. And that's what I got out of it. But I validate your interpretation. And I don't, you know, and, and certainly the intent, I hope you dressed, was not to oh, yeah, object to do anything offensive. No. Um, so next time you listen to staff and there's an So we'll go <laughs> So next one will be dancing on the ceilings. Okay. Uh, so then your next question. Um, well, the requirement of developers to do a right, social right. benefit, so, and so that can be used very effectively. It can be used effectively with one caveat, and this is another reformation in governance that I'm already trying to address, which is, there are some, like, Councillor uh, Adam Vaughn, for example, yeah. he's, he's been very successful in encouraging developers to leave 10% of their units for family-friendly dwellings so that we don't just have you know, these kind of lofts and these, you know, these tiny places, but that we try to bring families into the downtown core. And I, uh, you know, my hat's off to Adam for doing that. Um, that being said, Kristen is a remarkable counselor and she's doing that too. There are various different requests that council, local counselors make of developers when you're going through that initial nego negotiated period. What we know though is that Whatever we decide at the end of the day can always over, be overruled at the Ontario Municipal Board. Yeah, yeah. And that's why Councillor Wong Tam and I brought a motion <coughs> to the council to see if we could convince the government to free Toronto from the OMB. Because right. that is a, it's an anti-democratic, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's an anti-democratic uh, appointed body that can overrule your democratic anything, council anything. across Ontario. Yeah. So, even if we were successful at times to get that caveat in there, we don't know that our will will go all the way. So that's that's one other step we need, but I agree with you in principle. And then your last point about you know the hypocrisy of crying poor but then cutting our ability to bring in revenue. Um, one of the one of the major issues I had with the entire approach to the initial approach to the 2012 budget, which thankfully we in the center and those on the left, they label us as, 
I see us as just independent counselors, but we, we but everyone needs to be in a box, right? So um, we worked very well together to bring uh, amendments to that budget that I think reflected the will of the city far better than the initial proposal. But right at the beginning of the year, Mayor Ford said to every single department in the entire city, you gotta cut 10%. Mm -hmm. Every single one of you, doesn't matter what you are, you've gotta cut 10%. Cut 10%. Where I respectfully disagree with the mayor on uh, this approach is that he also, he and his brother are also the same people that will rhetorically say we need to run the city like a business. Now, you can't. You can't. Well, I agree, we're, we're actually public service. Yes. But even if you use that example of a business, I don't know of a successful business that will arbitrarily ask every one of the departments to cut 10% without having any idea of what effect that will have on their ability to bring in you know, the revenue that they're looking for. So in other words, whether it be not-for-profit, public service, or business, you don't blindly cut 10% off everything and just hope that it'll work. Um, we need to be more thoughtful about how we make our budget, and I agree that where there is waste, we all agree that we should cut waste. Waste is not good. It doesn't matter who you are, we don't like waste. And if there's duplication, you need to respond to that. I don't call it greedy. You call it for what it is. But I also believe that there are where you might want to cut 10%, maybe other places you cut 20%, but there are other things that you need to invest 3% or 5%. It depends on the needs and how you need to deliver the services. But which comes exactly back to the point that Paula made earlier with the mayor of New York, who's taking a land, he's going to, right? That's what you mentioned. Because exactly. I'm not under the impression that our mayor has that leadership. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, to come back to the, to the discussion, someone asked on the side, you know, where is council on this? And you said, well, you know, it's divided, but ultimately it's not a hot topic. Um, and I think that has everything to do, unfortunately, with the lack of, of vision and leadership that comes from the head. And we don't have that, you know. I, I, I agree. And I'm gonna, if, I, if I may uh, share something that I share with many of my constituents who feel exactly the same way as you. It's fair to complain and criticize, because we have something to complain and criticize about, I think, in the city today. And I think that it's, it would be not only preferable, but I think it's vital that we have a mayor and council that has a clear set of priorities, a real vision for the city, and then works in a way that unites rather than divides right. to get the city going. Mm -hmm. and that's what I'd like to see in the next term of council. Mm -hmm. But I also believe that whether it be politically or whether it be in my own personal life, I think that we also need to manifest what we can with, within the confines or restrictions and the abilities that we have in front of us. In other words, work with reality and manifest. Um, years ago, um, I, I was an actor. <laughs> and my and my and my my friends will still tease me. What a stretch from from theater to politics. <laughs> it's the same. It's the same. Yeah, really. no. But I I I was in a comedy improv troupe, and you know a great a great lesson that I learned from comedy improv. And you may you think like why are you why are you talking about comedy improv about issues of such import? But there's a lesson that I learned that I think is very valuable. And contributes, which is the first le the first thing about comedy improv is you accept all offers. In other words, whatever said you work with, because if you say no, if you block, the scene dies. So you work with whatever's on stage, because you've got to turn it into a scene that will that the audience will respond to and be successful. So I view I view this situation with the mayor and council and, and our city as this this challenge. This challenge that we can do something remarkable with. I've seen, for example, th thanks to Rob Ford, people like Karen Stintz and Joe Mahevic working collegially together, they never would have under the last term of council. Joe was a lefty, Karen was considered a righty, now they fight together on transit. I've seen um, people who never talk to each other talk to each other. I've seen council 
work, although you, the headlines will focus on the conflict, the preponderance of us actually are working really well together. I've seen people on the so-called right wing be far more reasonable because now they're asked, are you with Rob Ford? They're like, I'm not with that guy. <laughs> you know, let's, let's negotiate and compromise now. In other words, thanks to Rob Ford, I actually see council doing great work together. <laughs> so, you know, I think every day on the football field is another good day for Toronto. And, 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 and I say, <laughs> and I say this with all humility and candor, maybe far too much candor, <laughs> right? You're on, you're on. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but I do believe that um, you may not see a qualified list from the mayor right now of the vision that we all want. We don't have the top 10 list, and we don't have that agenda that's coming out in a linear way. But I'm seeing four new rapid transit lines being approved, and I'm seeing uh, councillors taking the lead on trying to take on the challenge of, of, of affordable housing. And you're seeing a senior strategy moving forward. And you're seeing um, you know, leaders like Councillors Long Tam and Adam Vaughn, a lot of planning files. And I'm seeing people who will surprise you from different you know, areas of, of, of ideology come forward and work together on different things. So I'm actually very optimistic. I think we've got a great council. I think we're doing a lot of good work. And I think that the media is obsessive in a stalkerish way sometimes about just the Rob Ford follies. But it doesn't, I think, reflect a lot of the good work. Next term, yes, I hope that we have a moderate, uh, well-tempered, thoughtful mayor and a council that, 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 that works more to work together. Thank you. I, thank you. I'm, but but whomever, whoever that might be, uh, uh, you know, and, and a council that wants to work together and not, not label or brand, but just want to get some good work done. I guess, one, how are we going to do Do I get one question? Sure, one question I have. Oh, oh, okay, sorry, I just, I didn't realize what time. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what I wanted to comment on was all the fabulous comments that are coming around this table that are actually all about anti-aging. That we live, and I don't care what you say, we have tons of research, we live in an ageist society. And one of the groups that are most discriminated against are actually older people. But I will say, teenagers, we all roll our eyes, like I lock my children in the basement until they grow up. Um, that's ageist too. And so there, we live in an ageist society. You talk about vision, you talk about leadership, you talk about poor love, poor. Behind all of that is the piece that we have negative stereotypes of older people. And that part of your presentation included uh, communication. Which brings Moses Island to Mark. No, no, please don't. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to. I, I, don't worry. No, no, he, he comes to mind because he yeah. owns media and he has opportunities. Mm -hmm. As do a lot of, you're from the media as well. And you will appreciate this. We need to start promoting, we need a media strat, a social media strategy and a media strategy that starts to communicate that older adults are citizens of the city they are contributors. They're not just takers. They're not just about service. They're valuable contributors that we need to rethink aging. We need a campaign, something like that, in this city that's subtle, that's funny, like mm -hmm. you say. Humor goes way further than anything. Yes. Uh, and uh, like, for example, Silvera in Alberta has ads on, <laughs> for sassy seniors. They're funny beyond belief. And they're, not a, they're absolutely anti ageist we need something like that, and I would like to see that as part of your campaign. Thank you. It's yeah. subtle. It's subtle. I'm not going to put it in the workbook because there's no place for it, really. But that's the kind but a way, of thing. But a way to deliver the strategy. We need to, to deliver this yeah. information in bits and pieces all over the city about this underlying attitude. Like, we ran a program for grade 12 students in the city. Huge difference on their attitude towards older people. They didn't know anything about it. Because the media never talks about it. It's not there. We started groups in universities across this country for students to learn about gerontology. Aging. Wow. We couldn't keep we couldn't even afford to keep them going. There was so much interest. So we need to do that at a much the overarching level that all of you are talking about. All of these factors fall in there. 
And, and, and I agree with you. And, and you know, a point was raised before about creating not only an age-friendly city, but a, but a friendly city. Yeah. And I think empathy needs to be part of the message too. I mean, you know, to be very fair, I think we all need to, we all need to be part of this. When we talk about Moses Snymer, I'm going to dare go there for a moment. <laughs> you may disagree with some things he's done. But he's also a senior who cares about what he believes in and probably believes in what he, how he's doing it. You can disagree with it. Rob Ford, for example. I have some very strong disagreements with his, um, some of his political views and his behavior. But I also believe that he adores his mom. He talks about her a lot. And I believe that he believes he's doing the right thing. And I want him to be part of the solution. I want to reach out my hand and say, Mr. Mayor, I want you to be a champion for this. And I think that as we deliver this strategy to the city, if we're going to get people's support to, to invest our time, energy, and resources into doing all these things we need to do, they can't support, they won't support us if we just tell them, well, it's because we're doing it. They need to connect, oh, it's because my mother will use this, or I will use this, or my child needs access to this. And I think empathy and, and that, that kind, friendly city, I think, is an important part of that, that message. Yeah, but I think we need to organize that message. I agree. And we're not. <laughs> we're just, so, but you have a wonderful opportunity thank to you. do that. Thank you. So maybe I'll take, I'll take one more question, just because I know that we're, we're, uh, we're coming to the end. Is there, is there any last? Just a quick comment about yeah. Cobb, in spite of the, the Z word. Um, Cobb is continuing to be a very good source of advocacy for seniors. And the traditional part of Cobb is continuing a bit separately from the Zuma emphasis. Um, and I really highly respect what they're doing um, in terms of really looking at alternatives and possibilities for, for seniors in every aspect. So I don't think we should just write Cobb. No, 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 that's very, that's very, that, that's very uh, kind. Josh, I just want to build on what Linda said before, because I think it's central. You represent a totally different generation and a totally different outlook. And our aim should be to start with the baby that you're about to have in January and to show that aging is positive at any, any phase, because all of these things were fell, fell under ageism of a fear of growing older. Having taught students for over 30 years in gerontology, the first question I ask them when they come into the class how many of you want to be old? Raise your hand. Not, not yeah, yeah. a single hand goes up first day of class. Last day of class, maybe not. But I think that this is such a serious issue and it is related to starting as early as you can through media and through education, mm -hmm. through the schools, through whatever partnerships. And every time you make those, you're building against Asian and building for this creative, mm -hmm. this creative well, building of, wow, I'm old, thank goodness. Well, <laughs> My hair is great. Well, and, 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 allow, and allow, me, allow me just to use that as sort of a segue to a, a conclusionary remark that um, I, I, think, I think a timeless irony is that, as you, as you alluded to, none of us want to grow old, but none of us want to die. And, right. and uh, there's, there's the quote. If I'm lucky, it'll be it'll be a, it'll be a line in a Lionel Richie song yes. one day. And 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 you know, I think we can bring in all the, the you know the issues that we discussed into that kind of that nutshell, and, and also to bring in kindness and empathy, where where we where we create an age-friendly city. We're creating the kind of city that both you know, selfishly want, altruistically we build for others, but it's a kind city. It's a city that is there reflecting the needs of all of us. Not one group, not one individual should be more entitled to the, 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 the access and the resources and the availability of services than another. Um, today is interna the first International Day of the Girl. Uh, it's a UN day. So, uh, to, to those who, who, can, who consider themselves girls, who have girls, and all the wonderful women that are here, uh, 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 happy International Day of the Girl. And you know that's that, that's been another struggle to find uh, uh, you know social and economic equality for for women, as have many other groups in our society. People of different ages should have have it no different. 
We need a just society, a fair society, a civil and accessible society. This strategy is a part of it. It's not the last word on it, but it's something that we as a city can do, and that's what we're working on. But again, I remind you, we need you. I need you to work with me on this. And uh, I have no doubt that we can get some good work done together. So thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate it. And <laughs> we're broke like you. <laughs> we took 10% out of our budget at U of T. So enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you so yeah. much. I want to talk to you.